Yes. <laughs> okay. Today, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're also celebrating, looking in the Scripture at the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13 today in your copy of Scripture. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. It is possible that you have these verses memorized. Many, many people in many different churches, in many different backgrounds, have recited the Lord's Prayer. And today, as we look at these words in English, it is very, very probable that you already have these words memorized. On this, on this day that we're uh, having the Lord's Supper, we also happen to have a picnic afterwards. There is a spiritual remembrance, but then there's also a picnic afterwards. Uh, Mindy has brought sandwiches and brownies and other things for at least a dozen people. So, I mean at least a dozen people. So if you happen to be here today and you say, Oh, I forgot. For at least a dozen of you, consider sticking around an extra 10 or 15 minutes and sharing in the fellowship time so that we can celebrate today the Lord's Supper, but we can also celebrate the Lord's Prayer as we look at the Scripture and then just a little bit later we can celebrate the fellowship with other believers. And so, so thankful for Susan Verratti, who doesn't happen to be here today, but Susan with Kingdom's Kids and Jim with God Squad and the youth program. And please do consider, uh, as Jim announced already, I'm simply repeating, there are some students that come from the Word of Life program. And they help beginning in October. But for these few weeks in September during that transition period, if you could help with the children or with the youth or even beyond that transition period, if you could continue to help, please be thinking about that. Is there somebody in your mind that as a child you said, oh, I want to be like them when I grow up? Was there someone that could ride the bicycle and when you were a child, you watched somebody else riding the bicycle and you said, oh, someday I want to be able to ride the bicycle. Or can you even remember, yes, we're in a worship service, but can you remember that glorious moment when you rode a bicycle and all of that balancing that you tried to do it suddenly came together. Or, or maybe, maybe in your family, you watched the way your mother prepared a certain meal. And you said, oh, someday I want to be able to prepare a meal like that. Or maybe you watched someone who was a talented musician. And you said, oh, someday, someday I wish that I could be like that person. While we focus today on Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, if you have a Bible with you, if you would just briefly begin in Matthew chapter 5. What a day that would have been in Matthew chapter 5. What a day that would have been to be part of the crowd when Jesus went on top of the mountain and began to preach a sermon. You and I have been in many wonderful worship services in our lives, but oh, what it would have been like to be part of that crowd in Matthew chapter 5 and as, as Jesus shared the Beatitudes and as He shared about people being blessed. And then as He challenged people to be salt and light, Beautiful pictures. Salt is something that you can't see. But if it is added, you can tell it immediately. People need to be salt in their homes. They need to be salt in their schools. They need to be salt in their businesses. 
It might not be seen, but as Christians, as the Christian testimony is added, oh, it makes such a difference. But on the other hand, there are times to be light, to stand and to proclaim the good news of Christ. And Jesus came to fulfill the law. And He talked about practical things like anger. What do you and I do when we're angry or lust? Even to this day, people are tempted with these kinds of things. What happens with a divorce or taking oaths or retaliating? What should you do about your enemies? And Jesus has the audacity to teach that you should love your enemies. And then going on in chapter 6, what about poor people giving to needy people? And what about prayer? And all around the world today, there are people praying. They are following rituals. They are following techniques because they desperately want to be in relationship with a God. A man that I know named Tom Wolfe accurately adds a phrase. In most of the world today, people are trying to appease an angry God. In most of the world's religions today, whether people are spinning a wheel, or whether people are shaking incense sticks, or whether people are lying prostrate on the ground, they are trying to appease an angry God. And they are simply reciting words as though they were magical formulas. During the past several years, whether you watched the movies or not, whether you read the books or not, possibly you heard about Harry Potter. And Harry Potter was a young uh, magician that's not the right word. He's not a magician. He's a, he's a young wizard. Thank you. And he had to go to school and he had to recite the formula in just the right way because if you could recite the formula in just the right way, then it would be magical and something special would happen. And there are some people and they approach prayer that way also. Oh, if I can just recite the formula the correct way, if I can just say the words the right way, if I can just mimic the imitations the right way, then God is bound to do something like magic. But in contrast to that, Jesus says it's not about rituals. It's not about many, many words. It's about entering into a relationship with God to be in right relationship with people, and to be in right relationship with God. And as we look at Matthew chapter 6, in the middle of what people consider to be the Sermon on the Mount, as we read these words, I think that it's probable within your own heart you will be saying the words in multiple languages as well. In English, it says this, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In contrast to the world's religions trying to appease angry gods, or in contrast to the physical philosophies of today that says there is nothing spiritual. There's just the energy source that keeps the universe going in contrast to those atheistic philosophies or in contrast to those angry theologies about a God that is angry, Jesus proclaims to us what it's like to be in relationship with 
the one true God. And so when you and I come before Him and we are allowed to pray, Jesus says, start this way, our Father. I had such a good dad. He's been dead for several years now. But I can still remember my father. His voice. His humor. His work ethic. Even as I mention my father, you think of your father. I hope that you had a loving father. Sadly, there are men and women who did not. Oh, but whether you had a loving Father in this life physically or not, spiritually, we are not approaching an angry God. We are approaching our Father. Is there anything more precious when we come together in worship services than to see fathers carrying a child in their arm? Yes, as the child gets older, they don't do that. But there are several fathers among us that when we come to church on Sunday, we love to see the father, but we love to see them holding that child also in their arm. And when we are praying, we are encouraged to have the mindset that it is our Father in heaven. There is affection that we have. Hallowed be Your name. But there is also adoration. The God that we worship in the Old Testament times, the Jewish people would not even say His name out loud. There was such a reverence that when it came even written, God's name, they wouldn't say God's name out loud. They would substitute the word Lord that we translate the Lord. Many of you have translations of your Bible that if you look very carefully in the Old Testament, in fact, sometimes the word, the Lord, Lord is written with all capital letters. Because the people wouldn't even say God's name out loud. There was such reverence. So we have such a wonderful, affectionate relationship with our Heavenly Father but we also recognize that He is Lord of Lords, that He is the God of the whole universe. His name is to be hallowed. And tragically, it is virtually impossible to listen to a modern blockbuster movie in English where God's name is not used in vain. So we are surrounded by people taking God's name in vain while we, His children, are reminded to honor Him. And the Bible continues, Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's kingdom the kingdoms of the world rage, Psalm 2 says. But in contrast to that, the prophets again and again say this is God's will for kingdoms, that there would be righteousness, that there would be justice. Can you imagine what Budapest would be like if every government official was pursuing righteousness and justice. Can you imagine what every home would be like if every father was pursuing righteousness and justice? Can you imagine what it would be like to have the relationship with children if every child was pursuing righteousness and justice? In James chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, James says, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart. This person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself 
unstained from the world. As we are praying to a heavenly Father, we are asking that His kingdom would be here on earth as it already is in heaven. Isn't that how you want to pray every week? Don't you want to pray that at your office it would be a small taste of God's kingdom? Don't you want to pray that in your school it would be a small taste of God's kingdom? Don't you want to pray that in your family it would be an overflowing feast of God's kingdom? Of course, we're not perfect. Of course, we disagree. Of course, we, we, we have fights with our spouses. We have arguments with our children. We get in cross relationships with other workers. Of course, this is what happens to us. But when we pray, we are encouraged to think about God's kingdom and to ask for it to be that way here on earth. Many men and women go to the same bed at night, but it is cold because the warmth of relationship has been lost. They are physically sleeping in the same bed, but the relationship has become so severed that there is no warmth. We pray to God our Father. We seek for His kingdom, His relationships, His attitudes, His actions to be reflected. And we call out in verse 11 for our daily bread. Bread tastes so good. Some people are so smart. They are baking bread in the metro system here in Budapest. And as you come up the escalator, you don't know where it is, but it's there. Oh, you might not even stop to buy it, but oh, you can smell the aroma of fresh bread. And whatever your need is, is today. Do you need to be healed physically? Do you need to be healed emotionally? Do you need to be healed spiritually? Jesus says, cry out. Please, Father, give us today our daily bread. Yes, you can eat old stale bread And it will keep you from starving. But oh, to be renewed by daily bread. By the fresh bread that comes from our Heavenly Father. And as we have done all of these things, in verse 12, Jesus adds this interesting clause, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven debtors. Somehow God says that when we confess our sins to Him, it is as far as the east is from the west. And God, who is omnipotent, who is omniscient, chooses to forgive and to forget our sins. And when we come to Him, He doesn't say, hmm, well, there you are. Hmm. Nope. I remember what you did. No. The Bible says that miraculously, if we confess our sins, if we ask for forgiveness, God grants that to us. And we're reminded that as we ask for our debts to be forgiven, that as God's children, we also are to forgive others. 
And it's very possible today that there is someone in your life who needs your forgiveness. Verse 13, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Perhaps as parents, it's during the teenage years or the university years when children leave the home that this particular phrase becomes so crucial to a parent's heart. Because we know that children go out into the world and there are people who are trying to lead them into temptation normally, literally, in the dark. When are most bars open? At night, in the dark. What's one of the most effective ways to eliminate crime in any city? Establish street lights. People are trying to lead other people into temptation. And often, it literally is in the dark. And we're praying for people that we care about. And we're praying for ourselves that we would not be led into temptation but that God would deliver us from evil. And then there's the beautiful reminder that yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. When you and I are praying these prayers, it's not to some physical, atheistic energy source It's not to some angry God who is in fact no God. When we are praying this way, we are praying in relationship to a heavenly Father and we are recognizing it is Your kingdom. It is Your power. It is Your glory. Forever. A friend of mine has a phrase that I I like to hear. You and I must do what we must do. But only God can do what must be done. You and I must call out in prayer to the Lord of the harvest. You and I must do what we must do. But it is only God who changes hearts and who does what must be done. Amen. Let it be so. Father, as we bring these concerns to You, as Jesus continued the Sermon on the Mount, as we turn to chapter 7, we could also see His words where Jesus encouraged His disciples, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks Finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? It's not about reciting a ritual. It's not about turning prayer into a magical incantation. It's about having a relationship with God. And as His child, pouring out our praise and our adoration and our request to Him. What 
do you want today, dear child of God? Do you need wisdom? Ask. What is your heart's desire today, dear child of God? To see someone else in your family accept Christ as their Savior? Bring that request to the Lord. He cares about your spiritual needs. He cares about your physical needs. He cares about your emotional needs. He cares about you. Ask, seek, knock, and see how He will respond. Let's pray.